Hi everyone, my name is Yi Hui Kwek. I'm a PhD student at Stanford University, and I'm delighted to be here at the virtual TQC to share about our, pro, uh, our paper on quantum algorithm for pets recovery channels and pretty good measurements. So this paper was written with uh, my uh, amazing collaborators, Andrash Gillian, Seth Lloyd, Iman Marvian, and Mark Glody. And our paper is now in the archive. So uh, that's our archive number, you can check it out. So just to summarize the main points of our results, the PETS recovery map is a well-known tool in uh, theoretical quantum information because it has the property of approximately reversing a known quantum noise channel. Because of this property, it is ubiquitous and uh, it has applications in fields as diverse as quantum error correction, quantum gravity, and uh, so on, which you'll see later. Despite this, no systematic implementation of this map exists on, on a quantum computer. So what we do is we fill in this gap using the quantum singular value transform toolbox. We provide a systematic implementation of this map. And as an application, we can also perform pretty good measurements, which are also a common proof tool. So the PETS map can be regarded as a form of quantum Bayes rule. And I'll be more specific about that. So classically, um, we can interpret the statement of Bayes theorem as saying something about a classical channel. And when I say a classical channel, I actually mean a conditional probability distribution that is mapping an alphabet X to an alphabet Y. So the input alphabet is distributed as PX, whereas with the uh, probability distribution of the channel, PY given X, we can then derive the probability distribution over the outputs, PY. Given this, it's natural to ask the question, um, given these two probability distributions, what is P of x given y. So what is the probability of an input symbol given uh, an output symbol? And this question is answered by Bayes' rule classically. But there also exist uh, quantum noise channels, and we could ask the same question quantumly, which is given a de default channel input sigma and a known quantum noise channel, what is the reverse of this quantum noise channel? So the answer to this question is, of course, the PETS recovery map. Um, so I just want to emphasize that it's a function of the channel n and an implicit input state sigma. So um, if you have these two arguments, then it makes sense to define the reverse of the channel, which is the expression given below. And as one would expect, in the case when the input state sigma is a classical probability distribution, which means that it's diagonal, the expression below reduces to the expression for Bayes theorem above. So we can see this by noting that the sigma a is the input state to the channel, which is analogous to px. Uh, n dagger is analogous to p of y given x. And py is analogous to the, so py is the output distribution of the channel, and that's analogous to n acting on sigma a. So just by matching the, the exponents, you see the similarities between the above and the below expressions. So, the map below looks pretty complicated, but we're going to be able to use the quantum singular value transform to implement this map on a quantum computer. So before we go there, where does the PETS map appear? It turns out that because of its um, noise reversal properties, it appears as a universal recovery operation in error correction, as a rate achieving decoder in quantum communication. It has appeared in entanglement wedge reconstruction in quantum gravity, it's a part of an efficient Gibbs sampling algorithm by Brando and Castrillano, and it's also used to derive quantum thermodynamics fluctuation re relations. So it's really pretty um, ubiquitous. So let me start with a primer on the quantum singular value transform. So this is a recently developed toolbox, uh, which addresses the following general problem. Given an arbitrary complex matrix A, we would like to transform an input quantum state psi by left multiplying it by A. Now, A may not be a valid uh, transform in the sense that it may not preserve the norm of the quantum state, but uh, to deal with this case, we only require that the final uh, output state is proportional to A times psi. So what approaches could we take? If A is unitary, this is a very easy thing to do. We just apply to unitary A. Well, if A is non-unitary, non-square, or has a large operator norm, we can still do this transformation. And the way we do it is by 
block encoding A, which means that we embed A inside a unitary, and then we act with the unitary. So uh, there was this paper recently uploaded onto the archive, which I think provides a very nice pedagogical introduction to the quantum singular value transform. So you can refer to that if you would like one. So the significance of this A being in the top left-hand block of the unitary U, uh, also known as the unitary U being a block encoding of A, is that such a block encoding uh, can be understood as a probabilistic implementation of A in the following sense. On an A qubit input psi, we enlarge the input by tensoring in S and Sile, and then now the enlarged input state is, uh, can be acted upon by the unitary U. Now, we apply the unitary U to this enlarged input state, and then we measure the ancillae. If the outcome was uh, the all zero state on the ancillae, which occurs with probability one over alpha squared, then the first A qubits contain a state that is proportional to uh, A times psi. So now that we've understood the concept of block encodings, how can we manipulate them? Well, that's what the QSVT toolbox was developed to address. The quantum singular value transform is a general method to transform singular values of block encodings. Um, so we can think of it as a black box way in which if we, can, um, if we can approximate the transformation that we would like to implement on singular values by some polynomial, then um, there exists a quantum circuit that does the transformation on the singular values of the block encoding. So the circuit is provided in the diagram above. And typically, we would like to apply a general function to the singular values of A, which is not necessarily a polynomial. But if we can approximate that function by a polynomial, then we can just use this circuit to implement that polynomial transform to the singular values and thus implement a good approximation to the actual function. So as an example, let's consider trying to implement a square root function. So let's say that we have a block encoding of identity matrix rho. And we would like instead a block encoding of the square root of rho. Then suppose we have found a polynomial approximation f tilde of the function x to the half, where f tilde x only has to be a good approximation on the interval lambda min to 1. And the error on this interval is at most delta. Then the complexity of uh, the circuit that I showed on the previous slide is then uh, dependent on two parameters. The first parameter is kappa, which is 1 over lambda min rho. And we're loosely going to call this the condition number because it behaves similarly to a condition number in a sense that um, the difficulty of the transformation is proportional to kappa. And the other parameter that the, um, that the, com that the gate complexity depends on is this error of the polynomial approximation delta. So overall, the gate complexity scales as uh, order kappa log 1 over delta uses of u rho, where u rho is the original block encoding of the density matrix. So now I'm going to present our algorithm for the PETS map. Let's start off with the assumptions. So we're going to assume that we start off with the ability to implement the following quantum circuits. We're going to need to block encode two quantum states. Now, it's possible to efficiently block encode density matrices, even though the proof of this statement is omitted. And the two states we're interested in are namely the input and the output of the um, channel of which we would like the PETS map. So the input of this channel is like, uh, but by input of this channel, I actually mean the implicit input state, sigma A. And by output, we, I actually mean the action of the channel on the implicit input state. So that's N sigma A. So we need block encodings of both of these states. And secondly, we also need a unitary extension of the channel N. So one might imagine that uh, we might want to implement a PETS map in a setting where we have characterized the noise and we can simulate it using quantum gates. But of course, any simulation using quantum gates is going to give you a unitary. And then if you trace out part of the unitary, you would get back the actual noise channel that you want to simulate. So now let's break down the PETS map so that we can see how to implement it. So the PETS map um, is the expression that I've, written there, that I've written there. And it's a composition of three maps. So the first map uh, conjugates a, an arbitrary input by n sigma a to the minus half. The second map acts on the output of the first map with n dagger. And the third map conjugates the output of the second map by sigma a to the half. 
So it's pretty clear already that we're going to have to use the quantum singular value transformation to implement the first and the third maps. And the way we're going to do this is by using our assumption that we actually have the um, block encodings of n sigma a and sigma a. And then we're just going to approximate fx equals x to the minus half and fx equals x to the half to transform the singular values of those block encodings. But what about the second map? So that's uh, slightly less obvious how to implement it because we actually need to act with n dagger, but all we have is the unitary extension of n. So it turns out that one can write the adjoint of um, n in terms of its unitary extension, or in terms of the inverse of its unitary extension, uh, as is shown in the expression there. But the pro problem here is that uh, this expression doesn't uh, have an obvious interpretation of uh, quantum operations because IE is the identity on the environment is not a quantum state. So the solution to this is to use instead the maximally entangled state uh, whose density matrix is proportional to the identity. So we tensor in the maximally entangled state to the actual input state omega b, and then we act on it with uh, this um, unitary extension inverse, and then we post-select on the environment E prime. So our three-step algorithm is exactly what I've just described. Uh, and here again, we have the expression of the pets net, but here I've written it in terms of uh, the cross representation of its isometric extension, which is what we eventually implement. Uh, so the first step is conjugating by n sigma a to the minus half, and that's in pink. And then now I'm going to talk about the second and, th and the third steps at the same time. So um, the second step, which is acting with the n dagger, that's a little bit trickier because it's not actually contiguous. So we see that um, in order to prepare for the second step, we already have to, way before we implement uh, phase one, we have to tensor in the maximally entangled state on E E tilde to um, the actual input state omega. And then we act with uh, phase one, which is uh, N sigma to the minus half. Then we act with the unitary extension of the channel. And then we do the phase three, which is, uh, sigma, which is acting with sigma a to the half. And then finally, we post select on the zero ancillas in the E prime register. And this completes phase two. And finally, we have an additional environment register E tilde, but we, we just trace over it and ignore it. And this finally implements the map. So this looks like a complicated algorithm, but what's its actual complexity? So, just to recall the assumptions, uh, what we care about is the complexity in terms of these like basic assumptions, which are the number of users of a circuit implementing the noise map and uh, a circuit that uh, implements the input state, which in the sense that it's a block encoding of the input state. So the relevant parameters here are the condition number of the uh, implicit output state of the circuit. So that's condition number of n sigma a and also the cross rank of n, which uh, is kind of like a measure of the complexity of the map that we actually want to reverse. And in terms of these two parameters, we can implement the PETS map with square root of the cross rank times condition number, number of users of un, which is the circuit that implements the noise map, the forward noise map. And this is actually almost optimal. And the argument comes from, um, from modifying the setting of Grover's search. So, so now we give a, a, a sketch of an argument that this number of users of the forward noise map is actually almost optimal. And we claim that more specifically, any algorithm whose gate complexity depends on either of these two parameters must use the forward noise map at least O d e to the alpha times kappa to the beta times for alpha plus beta at least half. And what we have is alpha equals to half and beta equals to half. So we are um, at most quadratically worse than optimal. And the idea to prove this claim is that we will construct an explicit recovery map on n basis states where both of these two parameters are equal to n. And because the recovery map actually performs a Grover search, so we know from the Grover search lower bound that the number of users of the forward map necessary, where the forward map is something like the oracle, is square root of n.
So as an application of our findings, um, we are also able to implement pretty good instruments, actually, uh, of which a special case is pretty good measurements. And pretty good measurements actually solve the following state discrimination problem. Given an unknown row drawn from an ensemble where the ensemble has like a probability distribution over possible states, what POVM can I do in order to maximize my probability of correctly identifying rho? So it turns out that there is no optimal strategy for this problem when there are more than three states to discriminate between, but pretty good measurement um, is a measurement that does almost optimally. And because of this, it uh, underlies the importance of these pretty good measurements in quantum algorithms where they're typically used to prove uh, some lower bounds in sample complexity as well as communication. So it turns out also that uh, pretty good measurements are a special case of the PETS map, namely if we choose the channel to be the trace out channel and if we choose the default input state to the channel to be um, some um, function of the ensemble, then when we write down the PETS map, that actually implements the pretty good measurements. And so because we have an algorithm for the PETS map, we thus have an algorithm for pretty good measurements. And the complexity of our algorithm is uh, square root of the number of states and polynomial in kappa. So I'd finally like to conclude with the takeaways of what I've just presented. So we have an algorithm now for implementing PETS recovery map and pretty good measurements. This algorithm uses the recently developed toolbox of the quantum singular value transform. It is systematic and rigorous and is thus able to implement um, a really complicated expression very cleanly and precisely. Our algorithm is also pretty close to optimal in gate complexity. And we hope that uh, our algorithm will bring these useful theoretical tools closer to implementation on an error-corrected quantum computer. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, our, our, our paper is available on the archive again at uh, that archive number, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your attention.